recognize that happiness isn't a luxury. It actually elevates the performance of the organization. So when people are happy, they tend to be more productive. They tend to be more creative. You tend to have greater customer satisfaction and you have tend to have better returns on your business. And so when we think about this as being secondary, we're kind of missing the point because if we're trying to lead a successful business, it pays to invest in employee satisfaction. But the second point is if that is the response you're getting, then there's a good possibility that the people that this company has hired are not a good fit. And so I am not a big believer in the idea that you can transform people once you've hired them. It's kind of like the idea of marrying someone and then hoping they'll change, yeah. right? Not typically successful. And so a far better approach is to fine tune the way you're hiring to account for attitude and goals and ideals and values. If you can get that right, it is amazing how much easier management gets. Welcome to the Talent Grow Show, where you can get actionable, results-oriented insight and advice on how to take your leadership, communication, and people skills to the next level and become the kind of leader people want to follow. And now, your host and leadership development strategist, Haleli Azulai. Welcome back, Talent Growers. This is Haleli Azulai, your leadership development strategist here at the Talent Grow Show. And I'm looking forward to introduce my guest, Ron Friedman, to you. I'll give you more of his background as we get into the conversation. But let's just say that he brings so much scientific research to make work better. And you're going to get super actionable, very practical advice about how you can motivate employees, how you can develop employees, even how you can hire employees better even how to drink your coffee in the morning better. How specific can you possibly get more than that, right? So I can't wait for you to listen to this episode. Just want to make a little note that we did have some buffering on our recording, on our connection for whatever reason. And if you're a regular listener to the show, you know that most of the time our sound quality is great. But for some reason, there was some buffering going on. And my editor, who is truly a magician, Tom, thank you, do a great job. And he is going to work his hardest to get this buffering out of there. But with a little bit remnants that that remain, I hope that you will forgive us for that because this episode, this conversation was way too good for me to scrap. So without further ado, here we go. Ron Friedman on the Talent Grow Show. Welcome back, talent growers. This week, I have Ron Friedman on. He is an award-winning social psychologist who specializes in human motivation. He is the author of a highly acclaimed book called The Best Place to Work, The Art and Science of Creating an Extraordinary Workplace. He's a frequent contributor to the Harvard Business Review, Psychology Today, Fast Company, Forbes and CNN, and he has served on the faculty of the University of Rochester, Nazareth College, and Hobart and William Smith Colleges, and has consulted for some of the world's most successful organizations. So I'm really happy that he has made time to speak with us today. People have heard him on NPR and major newspapers like the New York Times, Financial Times, Globe and Mail, Washington Post, Guardian, and magazines like Men's Health, Entrepreneur, and Success. Welcome to the Talent Grow Show, Ron. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure, and I'm excited to speak with you today. My guests always share a brief story of their professional journey. Where did you start and how did you end up where you are today? Yeah, it's kind of a funny story. I I started off in politics and then I decided I, you know, I wanted to learn how people make decisions. And so I went to the University of Rochester where I studied human motivation. And so my focus was on how is it that people get motivated and get more creative and more productive. And then I became a full-time professor. And one of the things you discover when you become a full-time professor is that if you like learning new things, which is what led me to education, then being a full-time professor isn't always the best profession. Because what you end up doing as a full-time professor is teaching people the same thing over and over again. Hmm. So I decided to leave academics and I went into the corporate world where I became a pollster. So my job was to measure public opinion, figure out what is it that people think, and then advise organizations using psychological principles on how to shift those opinions. And what I discovered in the process of being in the corporate world is that there is a just a massive 
gap between what we know the factors are that lead to top performance and how most organizations operate. So I took a risk and I got a book deal and then I quit my job to write a book and that book became The Best Place to Work. And in it, I take over a thousand academic studies and translate them into plain English so that anyone, regardless of whether they're a CEO or an executive, just someone starting out, has access to the latest research on how they can improve their performance and create an extraordinary workplace. Very interesting. I enjoy hearing about people's meandering paths. They're rarely, they're rarely a straight line anyway. It's true. And you know, I tell people I'm kind of like Slumdog Millionaire, where I mean, I think we're all Slumdog Millionaires, right? Where you think, remember that movie where at the yeah. end, it just, it just happens to be a unique set of experiences that led him to where he was. And, you know, politics taught me how to talk to the press. And uh, I worked in marketing when I was a pollster. And so that helped me book. And obviously, to understand research and and the consulting world led me to translate research into actionable findings. And so it just all came together. It's really interesting how that happens. Yeah. And I love how you are able to trace the skills you've built in every step along the journey, because that's one of the things I try to impress on people. There's always a way in which you can reframe what you're doing as something that's adding to your skill set, even if it isn't a perfect fit for you. I think the real metric that people have to be focused on is, am I learning new things? It's not so much, is this exactly where I hoped I would be, you know, at the end of the movie? That's not what your focus should be, is even if you're not really enjoying yourself on a day-to-day level, if you're learning new things, chances are your experience is going to be valuable. True. And Gallup polls show that the main reason people leave jobs and look for new jobs, especially people in the millennial generation, is that they feel like they're no longer learning. Yes. And it's actually one of the key factors to make for great workplace. And and that is making sure that you're building processes in place that actually allow people to learn new things without, and this is critical, without it being a time sink for you as a leader. And this is where I think there's a lot of opportunity for improving people's chances of learning new things is creating systems that enable people to learn new things without having to rely on a boss. Because the reality is, if you're a leader, you're busy. You're winning new clients, you're delivering presentations, you're leading conference calls. You don't have time to worry about whether every single person on your team is feeling sufficiently challenged. And so that's where the opportunity lies, is how do you create a system that allows for that competence building to happen without it being a time sink for you? Wow, there's so many things I want to ask and follow up with that. So one thing that you may not know, Ron, about me is that I wrote a book called Employee Development on a Shoestring, Uh which helps leaders figure out ways to develop people that don't cost a lot of money and also don't take a lot of time. So this is so aligned with my interest. Wow. Yeah. I need to read that. (laughs) Yeah, I hope you will. So I'll send you a copy. So let's talk more about your research and what you've written. And so you, you mentioned this one. I know your whole book is based just on this topic. You have many other suggestions, but let's dig in on this one. So you said that a system is important. Mm -hmm. Tell us more. Here's an example. And there are many examples in the book about how do you allow people um, opportunities to grow their competence without taking a a large amount of time or money. But a, a perfect example for me is empowering people to go once a month or once a quarter to pick a book that they want to buy that is in some way relevant to their job. And so I talk about it as providing a reading budget. And the idea is that when we're exposed to new ideas and fresh perspectives and have the opportunity to apply them to our job, that's when we feel like our competence is growing. And if this program costs you, let's say, $100 a year per employee because they're buying, let's say, four books a quarter, and every employee gives you just one good idea per year, this program pays for itself. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a different way of thinking about it where we have employees and we spend so much money on finding the right person and giving them the right equipment, but yet we almost spend no money on helping them figure out how to grow their skill set. And this is just one opportunity for doing it where it doesn't have to cost you very much and you don't have to think about it. And one company has a uh, Twilo in San Francisco. What they've done is every time an employee comes on board, they get a Kindle fire. And they can just purchase a book per month on that Kindle Fire, and they don't have to submit reimbursement receipts. It's just an automated process. Everyone gets their fire, and you can share books as part of a, of a workplace library. And now people are constantly being exposed to new ideas and bringing them to the table at the next meeting, thereby improving not just their own sense of competence, but actually actively building the system that the business needs in order to grow. 
Oh, I love that. And each employee can choose whatever book that he or she wants to read and feels is relevant. And you can always add on to this another element of creating a book club. That's just an idea that you can get people reading the same book and then create opportunities for them to discuss the book, which enriches their learning even more. For sure. And, and, the, and the idea that they are picking their own book is critical because you remember at school when you got assigned a book, how, how excited were you about reading it? Yeah. Not very probably. Uh, so that plays into people's sense of autonomy, which is their sense of choice. And if you're allowing for the learning to be self-directed, it's going to be all the more impactful. Cool. What else does the science say is really important for building an extraordinary workplace? Well, so we talked about competence and that's key. And so competence means doing your job well, but it's not enough to just feel like you're doing your job well. You also need to feel like you're growing your competence on a regular basis. And so having a reading budget is just one idea for growing competence. A second basic human psychological need that we have decade of research on, and I should point out that this research is not something that's unique to a particular culture or a particular generation. This is something that's cross-cultural, cross-generation, cross-gender. Uh, it doesn't matter how old you are. We all have these three basic psychological needs. So we talked about competence. The second is the need for autonomy. So having some say and some sense of choice about how you go about doing your job. And the third is the need for relatedness. So feeling like you're connecting with others in a meaningful way, feeling like, like you're valued, appreciated, respected, all the good things that come from human connections. That also is a basic human psychological need. And when we have those three basic psychological needs fulfilled at work or at home or even in a in a teacher-student relationship. What the research points out is that that's when we become happier, healthier, and more productive. And unfortunately, most organizations do a pretty dreadful job of creating psychologically fulfilling experiences. And so the best place to work is about creating opportunities for all of these psychological needs to be fulfilled on a regular basis. I talk to a lot of people that feel worried about that. You know, they think, well, I'm not there to be, you know, their, their camp counselor and I'm not there to be their social worker and I'm not responsible for their happiness. You know, let them find that in their hobbies or elsewhere. And why can't they just come to work and just do their job and stop worrying about this, you know, feeling good? To that, I would say two things. One is that recognize that happiness isn't a luxury. It actually elevates the performance of the organization. So when people are happy, they tend to be more productive. They tend to be more creative. You tend to have greater customer satisfaction and you have tend to have better returns on your business. And so when we think about this as being secondary, we're kind of missing the point because if we're trying to lead a successful business, it pays to invest in employee satisfaction. But the second point is if that is the response you're getting, then there's a good possibility that the people that this company has hired are not a good fit. And so I am not a big believer in the idea that you can transform people once you've hired them. It's kind of like the idea of marrying someone and then hoping they'll change, yeah. right? Not typically successful. And so a far better approach is to fine tune the way you're hiring to account for attitude and goals and ideals and values. If you can get that right, it is amazing how much easier management gets. Typically, it's the people who hate management are the people who haven't had good success hiring correctly. Mm, very interesting. Yeah, we had actually an interesting episode 51 with the former CEO of BB&T Bank, mm -hmm. one of the top CEOs in the world. And he was talking about how they hire for values, for a match for values, and they start there. Yeah. And also beyond values, I think it's also important to recognize that oftentimes the way we hire is heavily biased by the way in which we've been evolutionarily programmed. And so we typically find people who are attractive to be more competent than they are. We consider people who are taller to have more leadership skills. And we even evaluate by the sound of people's voice how trustworthy they are. And so people with deeper voices, like you think of, what's the name of the guy who does uh, Darth Vader? Uh, James Earl Jones, right? So he, he's got like the deepest voice or uh, there, Morgan Freeman is another great example. We tend to find those deeper voices to be more trustworthy. And none of the those factors t turn out to be true in terms of like, are do people with deeper voices, are they more trustworthy? Absolutely not. Are people who are better looking more competent? No, but it affects the questions we ask over the course of our interview, which leads us to get confirming information. And so I'll mm -hmm. give you an example of this. So for example, if I assume that you are an extrovert, I might say, tell me about your experience in speaking in front of large groups. But if I assume that you're introverted, I might tweak the question just slightly and say, are you comfortable in front of a large group? Interesting. And both of those get at the same piece of information, but they're going to draw out a different response, which confirms my initial impression. And so by having these false 
indicators of what a person is actually like, that leads us to ask questions that confirm the information and give us the response that we're looking for. And so the very process of bringing someone in for an interview is deeply, deeply flawed and so far better to figure out whether or not someone is qualified by looking at their work sample first before getting to the interview phase. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you, like, how do we overcome this? So look at their work sample, um, maybe ask for more information up front before the interview. You know, I'm a big fan of paying people for samples. Mm. So, uh, for example, if you are thinking of hiring a web designer, rather than bringing them in for an interview, have them create a sample task and hire five people to do it and then evaluate them by whoever has the best sample and then bring that person in for an interview. Because once you've identified someone who can actually do the work, then it's on to, do I get along with the person? We should not be starting with, do I get along with the person? Oh, okay, great. This is such good advice. Thank you. So one of the other things you talk about, I know, or write about is how work environment plays an important role in creating engagement and happiness at work. And you even suggest giving people a budget for customizing their workspace. I'd love to hear more about this idea. Yeah, it, you know, it's it's actually an activity that's being done in a number of workplaces like Etsy and Sony. What they do is they provide people with, I think it's $100 or something to, nominal, but it leads people to customize their workspace. And you want to do this for a couple of reasons. One is the more comfortable people are in their workspace, the more confident they feel in doing their job and the more optimistic they are. And so it gives them a sense of control. Like I am managing my area and that spills over to the feeling of confidence they have over actually doing their job well. So it's a psychological principle at at the core. But beyond that, people who customize their workspace tend to like their job more. And the reverse is also true. If you walk around your office and you find people whose job, whose desks look like they haven't been touched uh, and they've been there for six or 12 months, those are typically the people who are not very committed to their jobs. Mm-hmm. But it's the people who come in and have pictures of their kids everywhere and they've got artwork from their kids or maybe they have their favorite baseball team memorabilia on their desk. Those are the people who have committed a portion of their identity to their job and they identify with it. And so if you can get people to do this, then they tend to like their job more. And so it's just kind of a a little nudge that gets people to identify with their job. One of the trends that's that's happening, I'm seeing it with some of my clients, is uh, moving towards hoteling and having smaller physical spaces, having more people work remotely, or mm-hmm. you know they kind of come in on an as-needed basis or on staggering schedules and sharing workspaces. And that definitely, obviously, gets in the way of personalization of the workspace because you don't actually have a place to call your own. Mm-hmm. So what are ways to overcome that? Not only does it not feel like it's my space, but every time I come in, I need to take 10 minutes to like get comfortable and then I need to wrap up and collect everything when I'm done. The argument that I present in the book is that, you know, the way that we have workplaces structured is in some ways deeply flawed any way you go. Right. Because if you give people offices, then they're cordoned off from their colleagues and they don't have opportunities for collaboration unless they reserve like a conference room, which is something that is burdensome for people Mm. uh, and not always available. Uh, On the other side, if we use open space offices where nobody has any privacy, uh, then people are constantly feeling bombarded with distraction. And so what's the solution? The solution I present in the book is thinking about the workplace like we think about college campuses. And if you think about the way that college campuses are set up, pe- people have a space that they can personalize. That's their dorm room. And they have uh, opportunities for studying in collaborative settings if they want to go to um, to the, the, the campus lawn, for example, if they want to go to the cafeteria, or if they want, need a quiet space to focus, they can go to the library. And so what that enables people to do is it allows them to choose an environment that best suits the work they're trying to achieve. And if they don't do well, they get kicked out of college. It's the same. It's, we need the same sort of opportunity in our workplaces where we have a place that we can customize, but we also need locations that allow us to focus and locations that allow us to, to collaborate. And to the extent that you're allowing people a choice of where to work, not only are you feeding their sense of confidence because they're going to be more effective at doing their job, but it also feeds their sense of autonomy because now they're in control of how they're about to do their work. Yeah. So this is one of the keys about autonomy. Sometimes you can't give 100%. I mean, by definition, if you're working for someone else, you are giving up on 100% autonomy. And you can still give a sense of autonomy by presenting a couple of choices rather than just putting people into like, this is the only option you have, period. 
Yeah. And just to clarify, from an academic perspective, this is, you know, I, I studied with Ed DC and Richard Ryan. These are the guys who came with self-determination theory, which are became the basis for Daniel Pink's book, Drive. Yes. And so what they would say to that is that autonomy is actually not about physical control. It's not necessarily being able to decide exactly how you're going to do it, but rather it's a psychological sense of choice. And so it may be the fact that you're telling me to make tens a month, but if I feel like I'm driving that train and I have some choice in how, I, when I make those calls, where I make those calls from, my sense of autonomy could be at 100%, even though it was your idea. So mm -hmm. it's all about creating opportunities to, for people to feel like the work they're doing is their choice. It doesn't have to be every decision needs to be theirs. It could be the manager making the decision, but that doesn't preclude the employee from feeling like they have a sense of choice. And that's, the, that's really the, the million dollar question is how do we create opportunities for people to feel like the work the manager wants them to do is their choice. And, and the organizations that do that best are the ones that are most successful. Great. So the workplace is changing rapidly. And a lot of the research you have is based on what has been in the past. Do you have any ideas or thoughts about what do we have coming down the pike? Like what will the workplace of the future look like? Well, one of the trends that we see from other industries, particularly in sports, for example, is the use of analytics to make better decisions. And so if you think about how baseball teams operate, everyone has some type of analytics person who's looking at when players are at their best and how to optimize performance using actual behavior in the past. I think we're going to get a lot better at determining when we're at our best. And so one example of the way in which research is now being used in this way is when people are looking at how their energy levels fluctuate over the course of the day. So some of us are early birds, others are night owls. And if you can find the time when you're at your best and match the activity to your energy level, you tend to be a lot more productive. So that's an example of how analytics can inform the decisions you make to improve your performance. Another thing I think that's going to help is I think we're, we're going to see a lot more organizations encouraging people to disconnect from work. Our performance at work is just no longer about what we do between the hours of nine and five, right? And so we are, we, we are all chained to a smartphone to a certain extent where we carry around an office with us in our pocket. And if we're on all the time, that doesn't improve our performance. In fact, it hurts it. And so you see a number of organizations that are actively encouraging people to disconnect, encouraging people to exercise, and encouraging people to take time off to be present with their families, because to the extent that you're thriving at home, that's going to improve your performance at work as well. So I think that's another example of how more analytics and more of an understanding of how people, when people thrive and how do we create those conditions, those conditions need to extend beyond the workplace and into the home. Because if the company is has this implicit uh, expectation that you're going to be on email all the time, that's going to lead to burnout and we performance, not better performance. Hmm. And I know that productivity is a big focus um, area for you now. I know I, uh, by the way, I subscribe to your newsletter. It's one of the uh, only newsletters that I actually regularly read. I really appreciate it. Well, will be linking to a way for people to sign up for that because I definitely recommend it. But I can tell from your newsletter that you really focused on productivity. You've been writing about it. You're offering online courses about it. And there's so much in that that we won't be able to get into today. But I'd love for you to include maybe one or two of your favorite tips or hacks or tweaks that you think maybe are more on the counterintuitive or uncommonly known side that listeners can use in, in upgrading their own productivity uh, as busy professionals? Well, first of all, thank you very much for saying that. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, one example of a finding that I find really interesting and is not something that a lot of people know is that most of us are drinking coffee the wrong way. <laughs> and so <laughs> if you think about the word productivity, you know, a lot of people uh, associate that with drinking a lot of caffeine and just really being focused and sharp and being as alert as possible. And so what do we do when we first get up in the morning is we drink a cup of coffee. Well, it turns out that drinking coffee first thing in the morning is not ideal. And it's because your body is naturally producing a hormone called cortisol first thing in the morning, and that gets you alert. And when you drink coffee first thing in the morning, that actually um, leads to weaker production of cortisol because your body says, oh, I guess this, you know, it senses that you're alert enough and it no longer produces as much as a 
otherwise would. Huh. And so the reason, you know, a lot of us, you know, first thing, if we can't even imagine not drinking coffee first thing in the morning because we're so used to it and it's, we, we get that natural bump. Yeah. And, and so what, how do you explain that? Well, it's because you haven't had anything to drink for eight hours. It's the longest period of the day where you haven't had anything to drink. And so the recommendation is you're going to get a bigger bump from the coffee if you drink it a few hours into your day, not first thing. And so first thing what you want to do is drink a li- drink some water, not a ton, just a little bit, especially if you're not used to it, it can feel a little weird, but you'll notice yourself getting more alert, just drinking a little bit of water and then make that first cup of coffee, a cup of decaf and make the first cup of caffeine. If you're getting up at, let's say seven, aim for nine o'clock. And what you'll find is that you're a lot more energized with less coffee than you're probably drinking right now. Cool. All right. That's a unique tip. And I definitely love my coffee. One thing that I have recently done is I have to have a glass of water before I'm allowed to have coffee. Like that was a little rule I made for myself. So Mm -hmm. now I have to introduce a break. Hmm. Well, you know, you don't have to have a break. You can go right to the decaf. But um, the idea is if you're thinking that it's the caffeine that's waking you up, do that little test. And what you'll find is that, wow, I guess uh, much of that alertness comes from just being hydrated again. Interesting. Great. Well, Ron, thank you. Before we share one specific action that you recommend listeners take, what's new and exciting on your horizon? What project or discovery has your attention these days? I am working on another book. And so that involves a book proposal. And I have created quite a, an amount of work for myself that I, I don't know if this is the right way to go, but I am kind of discovering along the way. And so what I did the first book is I wrote a proposal uh, that was not very deep and detailed and I sold it. And then I, when I got into writing it, I did a ton of research before writing anything. This time I'm doing the research before I even write the proposal. And so I'm in my second month of just doing research in order to write a proposal. And so it's, it's been all consuming, but it's a lot of fun. Oh, can we hear an insider clue about what the book is about? Well, the book is going to be science-based. I can tell you that the first book, this one, The Best Place to Work, was about how do you take all of the science to become to create the best possible workplace. This book is going to be similar in that it's going to take all of the science and apply it to the individual. And how do you become the best possible you? Okay. Fabulous. Well, so thank you. And I am really looking forward to reading that book then when it comes out. What do you think is something that listeners can do today, tomorrow, this week to upgrade their own effectiveness as leaders and or as individuals, whichever lens you would like to take today? Well, I'm going to share uh, one of the examples that actually is used in the book. And I, I think the name of the, I think it's BMW that does this. It's the, you don't have to read the book book club. And what makes this such a great idea is that it it allows you to create a book club at your company that doesn't involve everyone having to read a book, but it involves rotating from person to person where one person per year reads one book and shares some of the best insights over lunch with the group. And what why I love this idea so much is because it allows employees to bring suggestions up without having the ideas be connected to them as as people. So one of the things that people often say to me after they read my book is, how do I get my boss to do this? And so what I tell them is, what you shouldn't do is don't get them a copy of my book and say, hey, boss, you should read this, Mm -hmm. because that's the equivalent of giving your spouse a book on how to lose weight. You don't Mm -hmm. want to do that. It sends the wrong (laughs) message. Yeah. Yeah. So instead, create a book club where people don't have to read the book and use a book that you want people in your organization to know about or ideas and suggestions. That, and so now it's the author suggesting these things, not you. Mm. And it brings up a discussion that allows the organization to really change without anyone feeling like they're being accused of anything. Great idea. And anyone can implement this. I mean, you can't make people do it, of course. And if you're not the one who calls the shots, you may not be able to force this to happen. But it is a suggestion you can make. You know, this is sort of like the criticized by creating kind of idea where you take initiative, which gives you lots and lots of uh, brownie points, I think, in any organization, uh, shows you as a natural leader, but also gives lots of value because if people actually try it, of course, they're going to gain value from it in a million different ways, but there is a, a win-win. You know, you get something out of it and they get something out of it and everyone wins. I think that's a great point. And I think that regardless of whether or not you get, you know, 100% of people in the organization to show up, or maybe it's even 1%, the, the idea that you're taking the initiative and trying to improve the organization by starting this, you don't have to read a book club. Uh, it, what it does is it positions you as a leader. Yeah, And so it's a way of, cha- make, of introducing change while also improving 
um, the way that you're viewed within the company. Perfect. So I know people are going to want to learn more from you and about you. What's the best way to do that? The best way uh, to get connected with me is to go on to Ignite 80. It's Ignite and the number 80.com. And the reason my company is called Ignite 80 is because over 80% of employees are not fully engaged at work. And so the mission of Ignite 80 is to reverse that trend by teaching leaders science-based, action-based techniques that they can implement within their organization to create great workplaces. And that is so needed. And are you on social media? Do you use social media? Where, where should they follow you? Yes, I'm on Twitter. At, I'm at Ron Friedman. And I'm, I believe I'm on Facebook as well. Okay. <laughs> but uh, really, any one of those, a great way to get connected. And um, you will get the newsletter, the best ideas of the month that uh, you were so kind to mention. Yes, I highly recommend it. And, that, and they can sign up for that right from your website. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Well, you know, it's been a pleasure talking with you and I love all of the ideas you've shared. I think it's going to add tons of value to the talent growers community. So thank you for your time and wisdom, Ron. Oh, it's truly my pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Super actionable advice. That's what we love here at the Talent Grow Show, right? So I hope that you'll take Ron's advice and apply it and let me know how it goes. Oh my God, I would love to hear that. You can always put a comment in the show notes page. That's always on my website, talentgrow.com forward slash podcast. Or actually you can also go to talentgrowshow.com and it'll go to the same place and uh, put a comment in the comment section, or you can tweet or leave a voicemail message. You know how to reach me and you know that I want to hear from you. I heard from a listener on iTunes recently or Apple podcasts, as it's now called with a great new review. So I wanted to share that with you. Thank you, Brooke Craven for leaving this amazing review. It says, Haleli Azulai, host of the Talent Grow Show, highlights all aspects of leadership, communication, and more in this can't-miss podcast. The host and expert guests offer insightful information and advice that is helpful to anyone that listens. That's great. I love it. Please leave me a, a review also on Apple Podcasts, and I will happily read it on the air from you. Well, this is it for another episode of the Talent Grow Show. I am Haleli Azulai, your leadership development strategist here at Talent Grow where we develop leaders that people actually want to follow. And we do that by consulting to organizations to help them build up a leadership development program, by speaking at conferences and meetings about topics related to leadership and communication skills, and by leading workshops and retreats and team development activities that help people become better employees, better at communicating at work, and of course, better leaders. I hope to hear from you whenever it is that I can help you. That would be my pleasure. And until the next time, make today great. Thanks for listening to The Talent Grow Show, where we help you develop your talent to become the kind of leader that people want to follow. For more information, visit talentgrow.com.